Hi, everyone, and welcome. Um, we're going to get started in about a minute or two. Do you hear background on my side? No. No, everything sounds good. I am going to mute everyone, though, now <laughs> who's not speaking, if that's OK. Okay, I think we have a really good group, uh, so we can go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everyone so much uh, for joining us today for this conversation um, on community ownership through real estate, uh, propelling a movement beyond a moment. And my name is Julia Dronzi Martinez, um, and I'm a senior program officer for community research and impact uh, at LISC. Um, this is one of our national teams um, and are super happy to be hosting this webinar uh, with LISC Twin Cities um, and also the Center for Community Land Trust Innovation. Um, uh, of course, um, in the wake of the pandemic and the ongoing struggle for racial justice, um, there's been a lot of growing interest in different models um, that can establish community ownership of land, uh, housing, utilities, finance, and other critical resources. Um, including as ways to um, repair the ongoing harms that are caused by centuries of racism um, and extractive development and ways to build community power and promote development without displacement. Um, and I know that a lot of folks who are on the webinar today um, are part of this work um, and have contributed to a lot of different examples, a lot of different resources um, on how, um, how to um, build these models. Um, and there's a lot of great resources that do exist, I would say, especially um, looking at things like community land trust focused on housing um, and housing cooperatives. Um, but there's less um, that has been written and shared um, about different approaches to community ownership of commercial space, um, despite the potential that it has um, to address a lot of the inequities that um, small businesses owned by Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, and community based organizations. Um, are facing um, and as a way to promote equitable development without displacement. Um, so we're really hoping that the conversation today um, can serve as a resource uh, for groups that are that are interested um, in those sorts of um, commercial applications of community ownership um, and are very excited to uh, be learning from the Twin Cities um, and efforts there to build a strong local ecosystem um, to support 
uh, community ownership, um, which we all know is uh, really critical for um, scaling these models and building strong movements. Um, and just uh, as a note, um, we will be recording the webinar um, and sharing the recording and sharing out the slides afterward um, with everyone who has registered. Um, so first, uh, we're going to hear from our panelists. Um, everyone is going to, to present their work. Um, and then we're going to move into a discussion um, and Q&A um, after we hear from everyone. Um, where is the recording going to be? Uh, we're going to create a resource page uh, for the webinar, um, and that's where we'll put the slides, the recording, and um, any other resources that panelists would like to share, um, including some of the reports that we'll be talking about today um, and other articles. Um, so with that, uh, let me share my screen. And I think too, you know, just uh, before before we turn it over um, to Gretchen Nichols uh, to talk about um, a recent report that um, Liz Twin Cities has put out, I um, just wanted to start uh, with an acknowledgement, kind of a grounding, um, you know, recognizing that while these uh, while community ownership has drawn a lot of recent attention, um, these of course are very very old uh, models and practices that have a long history and a very long track record. Um, the solidarity economy, community ownership, you know, a lot of um, some different terms that are referring to similar ideas um, has very deep roots in Black, Indigenous, and communities of color, um, rural and immigrant communities that have been practicing cooperation and mutual aid um, for many, many centuries, whether from Indigenous land stewardship practices to Black agricultural and consumer cooperatives um, to credit unions launched during the Great Depression and, and much, much more. Um, so this really long legacy of community ownership um, as well as the more recent initiatives that have been propelled by um, organizing efforts from communities is really reinforcing this idea that when we're talking about community ownership, we're talking about more than having, you know, an equity stake or a financial stake in a building um, or re receiving, you know, some kind of financial benefit from real estate development, um, but, but really talking about um, having uh, the folks who are most impacted by racial, economic, and environmental injustice, um, having meaningful decision-making power over development, um, and that projects are responding to a really clearly identified um, community need and stewarded to ensure that they meet those needs over the long term. Um, and wanted to include a quote uh, from leading community land trust practitioner um, John Davis here um, in that, you know, community ownership, community led development on community owned land, um, the different forms this can take uh, puts property and power into the hands of people historically deprived of both. It's also a bulwark against loss, protecting hard won gains far into the future. Um, and this, of course, requires ongoing organizing and planning efforts, um, even if projects initially begin, as we'll hear about more today um, with, uh, you know, with an organization or with a nonprofit acquisition of real estate um, with plans to build out community governance or ownership structures in the future. Um, so just wanted to um, offer that by way of grounding. Um, and now I'm going to uh, turn it over to Gretchen Nichols, who is a senior program officer uh, with the Lisk Twin Cities office um, to share more about their work. I see I have to unmute myself. Sorry about that. <laughs> thank you so much, Julia. And uh, uh, thank you for everyone for the great interest in this topic. It's really exciting. And especially I want to give a shout out to um, all the people in the Twin Cities that are bringing these models to life. It's really an exciting environment for us to be a part of. Um, I've had the honor of working with many of these community partners to better understand how this work form takes, how this work takes form. Um, and in those conversations, we really uh, had a really interesting and informative discussion around, you know, what does it take, what is needed to do more of it, and how can LISC help? So um, I guess we can move to the next slide. Um, in 2020, the Twin Cities and the world seemed to shift after the murder of George Floyd. Uh, as the racial reckoning continues to reverberate, we see this as an ideal time to push for the kind of structural changes that will reap benefits, not just now, but years and generations into the future. We have a rare opportunity to channel the momentum of a national conversation about racial equity into the development of community ownership initiatives and the ecosystem crucial to their success. 
And our intention underlying all of that is to find ways to eliminate racial disparities and displacement, support community building, and strengthen the local businesses. The drumbeat for community ownership has increased exp exponentially here in the Twin Cities over the last uh, few years. And based on our observations of community-led efforts in response, uh, LISC Twin Cities has provided a guide or handbook of community ownership through real estate models, describing a variety of options to get there and what to consider along the way. Next slide. So I'm kind of jumping to the conclusions, but uh, these are some of the recommendations for strengthening the practice of community ownership that we articulated through this report. Uh, first off is to build the ecosystem of partners involved in these efforts. How do we in include and invite in more players into the space and bring them into uh, roles of meaningful support? Um, how do we find ways of investing in organizing technical supports and network building? Um, how do we find ways to create financial products specific to shared equity structures? And this in particular is where I think LISC should be focused right now, uh, maybe in collaboration alongside certainly uh, amazing CDFIs like the Shared Capital Cooperative, which specializes in cooperative financing. Um, next is documenting and communicating the work to a broader audience, uh, sharing our learning for how to do this work better. And finally, bringing new equity partners to the table to align with community efforts. Next slide. In our collaboration with community partners back in 2021, uh, doing this work, we recognize that there's not a one size fits all approach. Uh, when groups are pursuing these strategies, it's important to be clear about what your primary goals are to determine which community ownership model is the best fit. Are you trying to maintain affordable leases or for local businesses? Are you trying to provide new ways for community members to become investors or stewards of local commercial real estate? Do you want to provide pathways for businesses to own their leased spaces? Are you working to revitalize an area by reinvesting in buildings through renovation? Do you want to create access to services by recruiting new businesses or services into your area? Those are some of the kind of the initial conversations. And uh, next is uh, who would be the primary beneficiary? Are you really looking to um, move these efforts to help individual investors in your community or businesses or kind of more, more broader community goals? And lastly, how will your efforts work, help to build wealth and or stability? Um, is it through financial profits, through investment? through wealth redistribution, through increasing access to ownership, or to, in creating long-term affordability. Next slide. So in the report, we tried to outline a, a continuum of community ownership models. Um, we wanted to illustrate uh, the spectrum from preservation of affordability all the way through to another side of it around building wealth as an investment in a speculative market. Um, so moving from affordability down, the land trust model is probably your by ideal process. Um, the next towards uh, the middle is limited or no equity cooperative models and nonprofit ownership. Uh, the next is the lease to own, contract for deed or community investment trusts. And lastly, market rate or business or worker cooperatives in which the objective is to provide incomes and um, businesses that are able to really succeed over time. Next slide. So the need to move quickly often undermines many community ownership strategies, creating the platforms and structures takes time and resources. So we tried to articulate or identify some ways for hybrid strategies that would allow to, uh, efforts to expedite site control such as working with social impact investors, working with uh, organizations like land banks who could provide the role of an interim hold partner, or working to create an acquisition fund to enable quick strike access to, in response to opportunities or challenges. And this is an example that we've adopted uh, through the Community Asset Transition Fund or the CAT Fund here in the Twin Cities. Next slide. 
Over the past couple of years, LISC Twin Cities has created the following resources and programs to help expedite this work in our market. Uh, first off being the Community Asset Transition Fund. LISC Twin Cities launched a $30 million flexible, affordable pool of capital to support the physical and economic recovery of properties located in and around the cultural districts that were impacted by the civil unrest following the murder of George Floyd. The CAT Fund combines LISC debt capital with credit enhancement from public and private mission investors to help secure and redevelop key properties in Minneapolis and St. Paul. In addition, uh, LISC Twin Cities has provided grant support for technical assistance, pre-development and capacity building to designated partners to help cultivate a vision for transformation and ownership that reflects the goals of the community and create a system that supports sustainable property ownership. The next area of work is around the Community Land Trust Capacity Building Grants. LISC provided HUD Section 4 grants to five community land trusts serving the metro region to scale up the production of land trusts throughout the metro region. The, um, this coalition of CLTs is working together to expand their services and innovative programs through marketing, extensive outreach and education, and resource development while expanding their partnerships. Um, wouldn't it be cool if LISC could be the go-to CDFI for CLT lending? We're trying to figure out what that path looks like. And lastly is uh, our Developers of Color Capacity Building Initiative. The purpose of the Developers of Color Initiative is to go beyond training to provide implementation capacity to support and to help developers of color get their projects over the finish line. The program will offer significant or does offer significant financial and technical resources to developers of color, including funding for pre-development and project management support and access to equity and permanent financing to help fill financial gaps. The goal of the program is to better support, position, and increase the number of developers of color who move beyond pre-development to project completion. The last slide. These are some of the examples on the ground here in the Twin Cities that illustrate what's possible and are highlighted in our report, along with the resource guide of consultants and organizational contacts for people to reach out to. Um, I'm really grateful for our partners that are on the call today who are, you're going to hear from. Um, they are working to help elevate this work both locally and nationally. Thanks so much to Dominique Jones from Prosper Prosperity and Partnership CLT, Eduardo Barrera from Neighborhood Development Center, and Mark Fick from Shared Capital Cooperative. So I'll hand it off. Thanks so much, uh, Gretchen, and thank you for uh, both that overview of, of different models and goals that folks um, might want to be thinking about um, as they consider um, engaging in this work and um, to some of the efforts in the Twin Cities um, to help um, support everything from capacity building to quick uh, property acquisition. Um, and of course, we'll be sharing uh, the link to the guide um, that Gretchen was referencing um, on the resource page um, so folks can dive into it. Um, I'm going to um, switch from being a moderator now to briefly being a panelist. Um, I'm going to try to be fast because uh, I want to leave lots of time um, to hear from Twin Cities groups. Um, but just to share uh, quickly some of the um, findings um, from a recent report um, that I authored, uh, Commercial Community Ownership as a Strategy for Just Development. Um, this was in partnership uh, with a couple different LISC offices, um, LISC San Antonio, um, who's been exploring um, commercial um, and housing focused community land trust efforts there. Um, and also big thanks, um, of course, the Twin Cities and um, LISC Los Angeles folks whose partners um, provided really important insights um, for the report. Um, so the report covers just a few um, examples of the different models and different approaches um, to uh, uh, community ownership of commercial real estate. Um, oh, wow. Sorry. I didn't know that th that's what would happen if I move my mouse like that. Um, so, and, and Gretchen touched on a few of these also, um, but just to note that uh, the, the report um, includes uh, several community land trusts, um, which I imagine, again, a lot of folks on this um, webinar are pretty familiar with. Um, and Dominique is going to share more about how this works, um, the model that partnership and property has developed um, for all commercial uses. Um, but just wanted to emphasize um, that uh, community land trusts um, 
are, uh, you know, we're talking about nonprofit um, ownership of land and typically with um, a different owner um, of the structures uh, that are on top of the land. Um, for commercial spaces, it may be um, that the land trust actually owns both and rents the space um, to commercial tenants. Um, and this is coming out of the work um, of the new communities community land trust that was founded in 1969 um, to fight black land loss and promote self determination and shared economic prosperity. Um, so since that time, um, over 300 community land trusts have formed around the country um, in nearly every state uh, in a variety of different kinds of market contexts. Um, and while a lot of them do focus on affordable housing, there's actually quite a few that do have um, commercial spaces um, that steward some commercial spaces um, as part of their work, um, including um, a few that have amassed pretty significant commercial footprints, um, including um, the Champlain Housing Trust um, in Vermont and the Urban Land Conservancy um, in Denver. Um, so the um, so the report includes a few examples of uh, commercial community land trusts, um, and then another um, of uh, what what are sometimes called like neighborhood crowdfunding approaches, um, the community investment trust model um, in which um, community members are able to purchase a share in an income producing property, which in this case is all commercial. Um, and the, the space itself is rented out to community serving um, small businesses or community organizations. Um, so two different models. And then also um, the report includes an example of a partnership between several nonprofits that came together um, to buy some commercial buildings in Los Angeles um, and are in the process of building out a tenant um, and community governance structure for the buildings. Um, so um, the uh, there's five case studies in the report that are um, intended to reflect a variety of different um, geographies and contexts and kind of approaches. Um, and I won't go into all of them now because we're about to hear from Twin Cities folks, um, but just wanted to note that range um, and some of those different um, models that I touched on. Um, so in terms of um, the findings and the insights um, that come out of speaking with uh, speaking with practitioners and the groups um, that are doing this work, um, one theme that was really clear that emerged was just the importance, um, again, to what Gretchen was sort of speaking to earlier, um, of defining um, really clear goals uh, and values at the outset of the project. Um, and staying connected too with um, broader movements for racial, economic, and environmental justice um, in order to ensure meaningful community ownership. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that the groups in the report are kind of drawing on um, or helping to build out local cooperative um, uh, or community ownership ecosystems. Um, and I think another piece uh, that's important for this is um, just, I think because um, a lot of the uh, all commercial community ownership projects do tend to have more of an emphasis um, on rental properties um, just uh, for commercial tenants for a variety of reasons um, related to some of the challenges in um, small businesses accumulating the capital to be able to actually buy their space. Um, it means that thinking about ways to build in um, meaningful decision making and governance um, and build community power are sort of other dimensions of ownership that are important, um, as is thinking about, um, you know, community wealth building in a more expansive sense, um, thinking about social equity, the ways that having stable affordable space um, with a long term lease um, can allow for um, small business owners say to reinvest in a business um, to invest um, some of that savings in other pursuits um, so those as complements to models um, that we'll hear from later um, that allow for you know building direct equity through like actually owning the space if that makes sense um, so that was one theme um, i think another another important theme that um, gretchen also referenced uh, is just that um, both in response actually to kind of declining um, or disinvested um, markets and to really speculative markets um, for commercial properties, uh, a lot of the groups interviewed for the report actually moved pretty quickly um, to try to acquire and rehab buildings first um, and then engage in, in broader kind of community planning and organizing um, to shape uses for this space um, and the organization's activities, including um, in the case of the community owned real estate project in Los Angeles plans to eventually transition from like nonprofit ownership of commercial buildings to direct um, tenant ownership and thinking through what that could look like, um, including potential like lease to own structures, cooperative structures, partnerships with community land trusts, um, and other options. And this is a little bit of a different 
um, entry point perhaps than groups that start with the sort of community led visioning and planning and property research and base building and then move towards um, acquiring buildings um, or land. Um, but whether projects sort of organize to get land um, or property or get property to organize, it can sort of happen both ways. Um, investing in that base building and leadership development um, and outreach is really critical um, to ensure that these projects um, can develop and that the governance structures and stewardship can be sustained um, over the long term. So I think that's a pretty important lesson, especially for um, community development corporations and other organizations that are interested um, in preserving affordable real estate while also developing a connection to uh, community governance and community organizing. Um, another piece is just um, uh, not unlike uh, affordable housing development, the importance of um, a solid feasibility analysis and due diligence on properties, um, as well as building out um, organizational capacity, building strong partnerships with organizations that have experience specifically in commercial development um, and property management um, and asset management, um, which I think, again, this is important for any kind of real estate development project, but commercial spaces in particular bring some additional build out considerations and costs um, that maybe traditionally are assumed by each new tenant, um, where having that complete understanding is going to be um, really important. And another point um, that um, some of the folks interviewed for the report made is that it's possible also to start with um, a lower cost but still high impact strategy for stewarding space together, such as community gardens or green space, and then um, build that out um, over time, especially through that kind of um, community organizing and planning work um, into a permanent use. Um, and the quote here just kind of reflects um, what that can look like uh, from the Anchorage Community Land Trust um, is where that insight came from. Um, uh, another thing is just for um, for all commercial projects, um, just because the viability of individual small businesses really contributes to the success of the entire endeavor in the sense that, you know, businesses have to be solid enough um, and producing enough revenue in order to be able to pay their rents um, for an all commercial project to survive financially. Um, having a really strong technical assistance and one-on-one -on -one support um, is really important to make sure that um, businesses have that capability that they're able to build out a, build out a really solid plan. Um, and that can also present groups with really hard decisions about tenant selection for the space. Um, so just recognizing that up front and then finding ways to build in um, those kinds of support, um, which the, the groups featured in the report do in various ways, um, in which I'm sure uh, Dominique can speak to more also. Um, and then just um, lastly, uh, of course, the need for strong, um, strong local policy support, strong local funding, capacity building support, um, in, uh, including public policies and funding to help scale the models. I think um, the uh, partnership in property um, and the Twin Cities was, I think, the one example in the report where there was um, some local uh, public support and an existing ecosystem, but other groups um, had to launch without that kind of support, which made their work a lot more challenging since they had to rely primarily on um, private fundraising for their acquisitions um, and for other work. Um, so there's, um, as we've referenced in the opening, there's been a lot of attention on these kinds of models, but in order to um, move this um, from sort of being this uh, moment into a sustained like longer term investment there has to be um there has to be um investment in these models um to translate that interest kind of into action um and then there's uh several recommendations that just reflect a lot of the points um that i already touched on related to um supporting that kind of peer learning and collaboration coalition building supporting the organizing and technical assistance work um, rapid acquisition, rehab and construction funding, and then um, on the lending side, um, both providing credit enhancement and thinking about underwriting practices um, and ways of um, understanding and thinking about risk in the lending process that um, could be friendlier and more supportive of these kinds of projects. Um, so I will stop there, um, and I'm very excited now to turn it over um, to Dominique Jones, the Executive Director uh, of the Partnership and Property Commercial Land Trust, um, to share more about their work. Thank you, Julia. And uh, there we go, my slides. So again, I am Dominique Jones. I'm the Executive Director, um, part 
founder of Partnership and Property Commercial Land Trust, along with Mark and a whole bunch of other board members. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So what Partnership and Property, first it was uh, a program that was incubated out of City of Lakes Community Land Trust. And there were a large number of community stakeholders um, who came together and you know, really started to think about how to make commercial real estate affordable and accessible to BIPOC business owners and developers. And so I came on to help uh, pilot this program. And then we later uh, founded PIPS DLT and incorporated. And we have been incorporated for this May, it'll be two years. I can't believe that it's going really fast. Um, and so what we do is we, remove commercial real estate off of the speculative market uh, and we make it affordable for BIPOC businesses to purchase. And we do this through a community driven ownership of land model. And so we envision that neighborhoods are you know, reflections of economic, cultural and social life of its people. And we know how important it is that places that anchor and hold and sustain nurture the health and wealth of a community and neighborhoods where local BIPOC businesses can grow and thrive, just how important that is to a community in its entirety, uh, especially when you are looking at communities um, of color that are, you know, gentrifying uh, pretty rapidly, especially in the Twin Cities. Next slide. So our goal, again, is that affordability aspect as well as the ownership piece. So uh, I was actually in Alaska a couple weeks ago meeting with Anchorage, and I've been studying their work um, since I started with City of Lakes Community Land Trust. And to actually go there and see just how they've transformed uh, their neighborhoods and communities was astounding. And we were able to learn so much from each other because although we're working in commercial the commercial real estate industry, our models are extremely different from one another. And so we were able to really learn from each other's models. And um, they're very intrigued in trying to incorporate that ownership aspect that we have done in our model. Uh, so we are able to do this and create affordability uh, through what we call an affordable investment. Uh, and so a lot of our model, again, we were incubated out of a community land trust. So a lot of our model kind of follows a similar uh, line item of the uh, community land trust model, which again, was, you know, has been around for a number of years and has been very successful in our country. Uh, so we didn't want to like totally reinvent the wheel if we didn't have to. And so just like a community land trust, we provide that affordability investment. Uh, it's typically 20 to 40 percent of the purchase um, of the building, purchase price of the building, and even some development might be included in that as well. And we also are hoping that, you know, what that can do is also go towards a down payment that a business owner would typically be asked to come in with. And so we're able to help them with that and lower their expenses um, when it comes to a down payment. Uh, what happens is, is that we tie the land to what is called a 99 year ground lease agreement. And that is how we are able to sustain that property uh, to sustain in the community, but then also to provide longevity to a pipeline of BIPOC businesses who may also want the opportunity to own commercial real estate as well. Next slide. So as I mentioned, we're seeing, you know, especially in the areas where we um, right now have started off really servicing um, this model in, like North Minneapolis, South Minneapolis, uh, we're seeing a lot of gentrification. We also are starting to see more um, happening even in the nearby suburban areas. Um, and I'll kind of talk about some of the partnerships that we're developing in those areas as well. But, you know, we know that gentrification in and of itself is not a terrible thing. You know, it's a process of neighborhood change that includes economic change um, and historically that disinvested um, neighborhoods by means of real estate investment and new higher income residents moving in. What then becomes the problem is that in gentrifying neighborhoods, when the homes are vacated by low income residents um, and BIPOC people, um, and other low income residents cannot afford to move into these places um, because the rents or the sale of the properties are too high, then it becomes exclusionary. And that's where the issue lies. 
And we are trying to work very hard to prevent displacement in these areas, um, especially displacement um, specifically of the businesses that have been in these communities for many years and are contributing in great ways to, um, to the community. Um, then you also have the issue of non-local ownership in community development. Uh, when we look at uh, North Minneapolis, there was a study that the um, West Broadway Area Coalition did, and it really showed the disparities around, you know, BIPOC businesses or Black-led businesses owning commercial real estate or owning real estate in general in the area. Um, and so what it shows is that, you know, Black households have a median net worth of just one eighth that of white households. Um, and then Black developers have a much shallower pool of friends or family and wealth from which to draw in order to raise funds for a developer um, equity. And so then they have to then go to traditional banking. And we all know that, you know, that those processes are also, you know, rooted in systemic racism and they face a lot of barriers going that route. Um, and so there is not a whole lot of data, which I find problematic around, you know, a correlation between, you know, BIPOC own commercial real estate versus white owned commercial real estate. Um, but just based on the racial disparities that we see, um, it can it can contribute to the statistics um, that showed you know troubling rates around racial gaps in business assets, um, which again provides clues about the size of the gap in general. So overall black Americans have less than 15% of the net worth of white Americans and hold a smaller fraction of their wealth in business assets. Um, and so again, those numbers are, those gaps, they're very large and it's very problematic. Next slide, please. So why a commercial land trust? Um, there was a feasibility study done way back when, again, we were with City of Lakes Community Land Trust um, that really showed these disparities. And it showed just how detrimental this can be if BIPOC businesses continue to be displaced and removed from um, these neighborhoods. We saw it happen with Rondo neighborhood. Uh, we saw it happen you know, in North Minneapolis on along the Penn Avenue corridor and the Plymouth corridor. And so just seeing how detrimental that has been to neighborhoods, we feel that preserving land um, and keeping it in community ownership is a solution. It's not the you know be all solution, but it is a very strong um, solution that should be considered in, in these neighborhoods. We also wanna um, boost BIPOC businesses and co-ops. Uh, we would like to even provide investment opportunities to community through um, the community investment trust model. Uh, and we just believe in the, the power and dynamics of community control ownership of neighborhood developments. Next slide, please. So here are some key components of our model. Uh, we were you know, incubated in Minneapolis and so that's where we got our start. However, that's not where we end. Uh, we are expanding out beyond uh, Minneapolis. We are expanding into St. Louis Park. Uh, we are also looking at opportunities in, uh, in St. Paul and then hoping to be able to provide consulting services to other community land trusts such as Anchorage um, and all throughout the country. So our model, again, is very unique. I've done a lot of research of community land trusts, um, and I'm starting to understand more and more what, why our model, why we're able to do it the way we can, and why it's a little bit harder for community um, land trusts to be able to provide that ownership aspect just due to the you know, government restrictions that they have because you know, they're really contracted, some of them, through the cities or the state governments. Um, but we're not, and so we are able to just jump right in, buy properties, and sell the, the buildings without having any um, too much issues around it. And so that makes us very unique in the country, and um, I think that it provides a great opportunity for others to kind of learn from what we are doing and implementing in their cities. We have around probably about 10 to 12 board members right now. Um, we are uh, we're recruiting 
and we're constantly recruiting businesses. Uh, we're trying to uh, launch a marketing campaign because we're still piloting the program and we're hoping to complete that pilot this year and operationalize our model next year. And so we really want to start to market our brand and our model to um, businesses who might be interested. Uh, we are starting, we provide technical assistance as well. Uh, we are contracted through the DTAP program in Minneapolis, which is the Development Technical Assistance Program. And so what we do is businesses who are interested in our model, we actually walk them through the process and we provide um, business experts like bankers um, and real estate developers to come in and kind of help them understand, you know, it's not just about running your business now. Now you're an, a commercial real estate owner. So you're, you know, crossed over into a whole nother industry and um, we wanna help you to be successful in it and understand it. We offer property management um, currently for our own properties and we're hoping to eventually be able to offer it to, um, to even properties that we sell to businesses. Uh, next slide. So our mix of capital is private, public, government, wherever we can get money, we welcome it. Um, our portfolio, so we have successfully purchased three property, well, yes, three properties. We are in the process of purchasing the 19 East 26th Street property and um, two more properties along 35th and Penn. Uh, 35th and Penn is an interesting uh, story. So we were actually approached by, at the time, this was a new cooperative uh, called uh, Northside Investment Cooperative Enterprise, NICE for short. And um, it's a community owned investment cooperative in North Minneapolis, and they purchase properties to create and maintain affordable housing, as well as commercial space. So they approached us about these four buildings that they saw, I think three of them were um, for sale. And then we were able to work with Land Bank Twin Cities to uh, work with the other landlord who wasn't thinking about selling their building and got them to sell. And so they sold all four of them originally to Land Bank. Uh, and then Land Bank is holding it for us to buy back. And so we bought back two so far. And then this year, we're going to be buying the other two. And uh, we're in partnership with NICE. So they're our business partner. And once they purchase all four buildings, um, and I think even before then, they're placing all of the businesses, which is 100% BIPOC, and all the residents are BIPOC as well, into a cooperative model where they can collectively um, participate in ownership of all four of these buildings. Uh, 19 East 26th Street was actually a property that was held, uh, well, it was bought by the city of Minneapolis on our behalf. So they were one of our champions early on. And so they purchased this building from Hennepin County and have been holding it for us. And we found a business owner who was going to own the building. Um, and we're going to be purchasing this from the city this year. 1819 Lowry is in North Minneapolis, and that was our very first purchase. Uh, this is one we just got right off the market. As soon as it hit, we um, picked it up and uh, we have a business, a uh, BIPOC owned business in there and they are in our lease to own arrangement. So they basically will be leasing it um, while they get financing or secure financing and then eventually buying it from us. So next slide. So this is a way to stay connected to us. Uh, we have a newsletter. Um, we're on Instagram, Facebook, um, LinkedIn as well, and we have a donation uh, link on our site, which is um, pipclt.org, and we also have a video that really walks through, I mean, in grave detail of how our model works, um, and so if you want to learn a little bit more, dig deeper into our model, please visit our website and watch that video, but thank you for having me. Thanks so much, Dominique. There's so much, so much to learn uh, from Partnership and Property CLT and so many good things to dig into, just the collaboration with other CLTs and um, other cooperatives, uh, the the support from the land bank um, and from local government partners, um, the support provided to uh, small businesses throughout the process of navigating leasing and purchasing um, property that the CLT is, uh, is stewarding um, the land under. Um, and I see that there's a bunch of questions for you in the chat. So we'll get into those uh, after we hear from the rest of our panelists. Um, so now um, I'm very, uh, very excited to introduce Eduardo Barrera, um, who's the real estate development manager um, at the neighborhood Development Center um, and is going to share uh, the story of the Mercado Central. 
Hello, uh, fellow practitioners. How are you doing? Thank you for uh, uh, having me. And Julia, thank you for organizing this webinar. I think that uh, many of the uh, stories that uh, Gretchen and, and Dominic have mentioned does do fit with uh, the story of Mercado Central. And, and what I was telling Julia is that uh, sometimes one image uh, or one picture can tell you uh, a thousand words, speaks for a thousand words. And the story of Mercado Central, as you can see on the image, uh, begins with a, a two story, two, two, two part story. One is uh, the Latino community in, in, in South Minneapolis, particularly, as well as the uh, neighborhood and commercial corridor where uh, Mercado Central sits uh, now and was back then. Uh, the story of Mercado Central really begins uh, in, a, in an effort to organize uh, the community back then uh, in the early 1990s uh, due to a series of uh, um, challenges that the community was facing. Uh, uh, immigration, uh, uh, employment, uh, uh, abuse from employers to, to undocumented uh, uh, folks in the community and so forth. So rather than uh, continue, so to speak, complaining, the community began to organize and create a, 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 a focus in which, uh, how can we uh, begin uh, developing our own success and our own opportunities to grow in this, uh, in this new society that as an immigrant we're coming to, to, to be. And so uh, that organizing effort began and through the model of the asset-based community development and the uh, community uh, inventory, uh, the organizing group began to discover uh, the talents, the assets, the social capital that existed in the community and the next step was, well, how can we put this into practice? How do we uh, benefit for this uh, background that all of us in the community have and, and can create uh, an opportunity uh, for us to prosper and, and begin grow our, our, our network, our wealth, uh, and have opportunities that can go beyond just the individual uh, benefit, but the community benefit, the communal uh, uh, impact that uh, a project can have. So out of that, here we go. Mercado Central was born. And Mercado Central is based on the traditional concept of a mercado in Latin America, uh, 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 you know, Mexico, Central and uh, South America. These marketplaces are very uh, common. That's, that's the day-to-day -day life in, in neighborhoods and communities in, in our country. So. Uh, the concept of creating a place where the community could continue uh, practicing and getting access to uh, their culture, their food, their music, and all the, uh, the aspects that make culture and make community in, in, the, in the Latino community, so to speak. So Mercado Central, as you can see, uh, was uh, uh, created with this in mind. And once the organization and the concept uh, was created, how can we put this into practice? And here, where the uh, here is where the uh, cooperative model came into place. Cooperatives are very popular in Mexico, uh, and so the the concept uh, generated interest, generated uh, a high level of uh, wanted to be part of this. Uh, uh, development or project. And so uh, a cooperative was created to allow uh, people to begin developing, continue developing the, the, the concept of Mercado Central. Obviously, there has to be a partnership that can go along with this. Uh, the community by itself couldn't do it on its own. So uh, partners were critically uh, important in the conceptualizing development and execution of developing a property that could uh, host uh, all these uh, businesses. Now, Mercado Central uh, holds uh, about 40 businesses uh, from restaurants to retail to service. 
So it's a mixed use development that serves all those kind of uh, enterprises that are located in Mercado. And at the same time, it provides a hub where the community, not just from the immediate neighborhood, but abroad from uh, Minneapolis can come to Mercado Central. In fact, there are people who come from all over Minnesota and sometimes from outside the, the, the state to visit Mercado Central because it's a unique uh, hub and destination, so to speak, in Minneapolis that people now recognize and, and, and feel very, very attracted by it. But uh, the, the story, uh, as you can see again in the picture, is the beginning with a border up uh, property that had a, a, a very negative impact in the community. In fact, prior to Mercado Central being developed, the corridor, uh, which is located on, on Lake Street in Minneapolis, was suffering for a huge disinvestment in economic activity. Right uh, before that, uh, Sears uh, uh, Distribution Center, which was a few blocks from Mercado Central and had you know, thousands of employers left, employees left the site and left that huge campus uh, so to speak, abandoned. Uh, uh, and as a consequence, the decline in the Lake Street Corridor became a, a very problematic uh, situation for the city of Minneapolis. And they stayed there for about 10, 15 years without any uh, occupancy in that campus. And so the economic uh, uh, impact that that created was devastating for the neighborhood and for the community there. However, here we go, uh, a group of uh, Latino immigrants who organized there, along with other partners, there to uh, uh, dream and create what is now Mercado Central. It's here in, in the picture, you can see three phases of the project. Once at the beginning, once it was developed, and what it currently looks like. Uh, so Mercado has grown for a concept for, uh, of providing opportunity for uh, individual community members to have it a great impact, not just in the neighborhood, but in the city as a whole uh, that creates jobs, creates property uh, uh, property, and sales tax uh, revenue for the city and for the state. And it's a vibrant economic uh, place where uh, uh, individual businesses are placed and those small business entrepreneurs have the opportunity to grow their individual wealth and family uh, uh, wealth for, as well. Uh, one of the partners in this initiative is the employer that which I now work for. Back then, I didn't work for NDC, but now I am uh, the real estate development uh, manager and I work as a community member as part of the, uh, the vision for Mercado Central. So Mercado Central <laughs> is very dear to me. And then a few years ago, I was, uh, managing Mercado Central. So I have a very uh, special feel for this place because I had been involved in so many phases of this uh, project and this concept that uh, truly brings uh, community ownership to, to, to the members of, of Mercado Central. And uh, here as a cooperative, everybody buys uh, a share of, of, the, of the cooperative and then by doing that, become a owners of the real estate asset. There is a two uh, entity structure that exists. One is Cooperative Mercado Central, and then there's Mercado Central LLC, which is the property who runs and leases space to members of the cooperative. So the, the way that the structure is formed is Cooperative Mercado Central owns the asset as a whole, and the membership buy membership into the space so that they can uh, lease number one. And by that, by being a member in lease space in the Mercado, they become part of the owners. So in at some point, Mercado Central gets sold, everybody gets a portion of that uh, 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 profit that gets uh, generated by selling the property. But the point is, this is a great vehicle or true of truly uh, exemplifies community ownership because the owners are the tenants that are there, uh, similar to the to the uh, um, TLC, but uh, uh, 
but not in the same way of the structure that it works here. Tenants are own, own the, the space as a whole and, and are part of the well creation at the end of the, uh, of the structure of, of the place. So, so this is a, a true way that uh, you know, uh, community ownership is presented. Now, it has its challenges, <laughs> as you can imagine. Uh, it's very difficult. The vision of transferring ownership from the initial developer to the membership uh, took about 18 years to get uh, uh, executed. But I, I guess in some ways it's good because now all the, the equity that was built over the last 15, 20 years now obviously has a, great va a greater value to the membership that own Mercado Central, the cooperative. So, uh, so that is the story of Mercado Central. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much, Eduardo. And I have a lot of questions about how you keep folks engaged through an 18 year process um, of building out the structure and buying the buildings. But I wanna make sure we hear from Mark and then we can move into the discussion um, and into audience questions. Um, so uh, very excited now um, to pass it over to Mark Bick, uh, the senior loan officer at Shared Capital Cooperative, who's going to demystify um, some of these lending and finance questions that I see um, coming into the Q&A also. Great. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, yeah, so I'm Mark. I'm with Shared Capital Cooperative. Uh, the one minute overview of Shared Capital is we are a CDFI. Um, but we are very unique in that we only lend to cooperative enterprises and and also unique as our name implies, we are structured as a cooperative ourselves. So we are actually owned by the cooperative enterprises that invest in us and the cooperative enterprises that borrow from us. So it a lot of a lot of our work is uh, you know on the on the numbers side, the business underwriting side, how we look at projects like this. A lot of it is fairly straightforward, making sure the numbers make sense, making sure the projections are realistic, making sure the structure of, of how the sources and uses are coming together to, uh, to accomplish the project that's being accomplished. But whether you're looking at something that is kind of purely a cooperative or looking that is something that is sort of cooperative adjacent, different kinds of community ownership and shared ownership models, um, as an underwriter and as a lender and investor to these projects, it is fund fundamentally important that we really understand the ownership and purpose and the mechanics of that ownership um, and how that plays out day to day and over the long haul for the sustainability of these kinds of enterprises. Um, again, with shared capital, we have sort of some metrics that we look at to help define, is this really a cooperative? And it kind of boils down to three primary questions who owns it, who controls it, and who benefits from it. And for us to be defined as a cooperative, we want that to be a clearly defined membership that utilizes the services or resources of the cooperative. But, uh, but again, with the variations that we're looking at, land trust models, other shared ownership models, community investment models, I think those three questions are still fundamentally important, whether you're a co-op or not, in unpacking sort of, again, there can be a difference between ownership and control, depending on the type of corporation that you're using and how that how decision making plays out. And um, and there can be a big difference between ownership control and who actually benefits from this enterprise at the end of the day. And so, um, you know, our uh, our ideal circumstance is to find when we're looking at a commercial real estate enterprise, we want to know that the tenants of that space the people who run their businesses or their organizations in that physical space have a primary role in ownership control and benefits and because what we're doing then is is you know we're 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 getting to what a lot of us have been talking about here is handing those assets the control of those assets the benefits of those assets to to people who un normally don't have access to that and and trying to sh shift uh, uh, both the access and the potential for wealth creation and stability, as was mentioned earlier on, uh, to, uh, in the case of PIPs ELT, uh, primarily Black and BIPOC business owners, in the case of Mercado Central, Latino business owners there, um, and making sure that that's, that's transparent and that's really what's happening uh, when we're going through 
the operations of this enterprise. Um, once in a while, we come across an organization that sort of looks like that on paper, but when you dig a little bit below the surface, you find out that fundamentally, it's just a couple of people that are really in control of this thing, or a couple of people that really benefit from that. And so I think it's important as an underwriter or investor that we open up those boxes, that we really poke at that stuff and, and dig into that to make sure it makes sense. And it is honestly what it says it's going to be. Um, and, you know, so in, with land trust models, with these other models, there is a parsing of these layers of control and ownership and benefits that has to go on in the underwriting process, making sure that the democracy is really there. Um, I, when as a lender and investor, we also, um, it, I think something that these enterprises need and that we bring to the table, and I think a lot of other CDFIs often do, is being more than just a lender and investor, that we become a partner in this enterprise, that we bring our skills and resources and capacity to the table uh, to help fill any gaps that might be there, but also to facilitate not just our resources coming, but other organizations and other entities' resources that otherwise wouldn't show up at the table uh, for these, these projects. Um, you know, digging in to figure out, is there a need for technical assistance and capacity support? That's not a negative. That's just identifying some gap, and then we're going to work to fill that gap because the goal is to be successful with these models. Um, we can't just be looking for uh, weaknesses to shoot them down. We're looking for gaps so we can fill those gaps in one way or another. As was maybe referenced in a few different ways already as well, um, you can't do this with just debt. Um, it doesn't always make sense. You know, if, if, if it could just be about borrowing money and buying real estate, um, these models would have already been out there and up and running for many, many years. It is about a balancing of debt and equity, of other capital sources, of patient, uh, patient lenders, but also entities like land banks and land trusts that can play, a, a, or like uh, neighborhood development groups that can play an intermediary role to sort of transition these, these, uh, these parcels over and this, these pieces of real estate over. As Gretchen mentioned early on, that can be fundamentally important in the world of real estate because opportunities arise when resources are not always immediately available. And if we lose those opportunities, it can be decades before that particular piece of real estate is available again. Uh, so having the, the partners and the entities that can step in, play that intermediary role and support uh, the nurturing of these enterprises is fundamentally important. There are, of course, risks and challenges here. And I think I'm repeating a little bit of what was already said when I highlight some of these, um, is, uh, is thinking about uh, shifting uh, the role of property management so that it is, no, it is not necessarily uh, investor owner focused, that it becomes tenant focused, that it becomes small business focused, that it becomes thinking about property management in the bigger context of sustaining this asset for the community, rather than simply looking to make money off of this real estate in whatever ways are efficient and effective for that purpose. And so um, it's not like you can just knock on the door of any old property management company and ask them to manage your properties and, and transform their policies and procedures and normal practices and expect that that's going to cut and paste into a situation for a commercial land trust or a real estate investment co-op. And that's been one real challenge out there is finding management, uh, experience management that can shift the way it operates. And we're finding that in some circumstances, we've got to start from scratch and make that management company happen uh, that doesn't exist necessarily in many markets. Um, there can be challenges in cooperatives and shared ownership around poor member and owner engagement. And uh, you know, just to be transparent, I think that that was for some of the years of Mercado Central that left the, led, led to delays. There were challenges in sort of how were members being engaged, how were they working effectively or ineffectively in making decisions together. And so uh, creating space for people to learn those processes together is important. Bringing in uh, folks who can help to facilitate those processes, I think is important as well. And in making sure that once you start to establish an organization, that staff and portions of leadership don't just kind of move forward without that membership, that that membership is brought along, that those business owners are brought along in the process to learn and grow and stabilize that enterprise together. There are uh, situations we have seen because we see a lot of interest in this kind of work around the country where I think sometimes uh, organizers of these, uh, these enterprises are kind of over-promising to the community 
over promising returns, invest in real estate in your neighborhood, become a part of the, you know, earn that money that somebody else was earning and now you get to earn it. That's not necessarily how it plays out. Again, because we're not investing in these parcels of real estate to become big profit centers. We're investing in them for stability. And so that doesn't have a big return. And so I think sometimes being uh, more transparent and uh, more direct with your membership and the communities about what are the benefits of doing this. They may not always be financial. There may be other important benefits that could be highlighted and should be highlighted and prioritized in the process too. Um, and then one gap that is kind of a similar gap uh, to um, housing community, com community housing land trusts is finding those lenders who just understand or are willing to, to practice with this structure. So it took a lot of time in many markets to get uh, home lenders, home, you know, first time home buyer programs uh, to work with community land trusts because, oh, we don't get the land, we only get the, the improvements. Um, that was a fundamental shift. And I think there are some similar shifts that will probably have to happen uh, for models like PIP CLT and similar approaches to help those business owners get the financing that they need uh, separately from the land uh, to actually become uh, asset owners themselves. Um, a couple of strengths, just to highlight, of course, in the model, there is strength in numbers in this case. Um, that, uh, you know, when we are working with cooperatives of, of any kind around the country, um, challenges that uh, those businesses may come across are often uh, much, uh, they have much more capacity to address challenges when you have more people around the table with a diverse set of experiences and, and energies and, and creative thought to bring that to the table. Um, we find a lot of strength in that group approach, again, if it's uh, facilitated in a healthy way. And I think to echo some of what Eduardo was saying as well, is especially for newer entities, uh, finding partnerships with longer standing existing enterprises can be fundamental to success of the of kind of helping to nurture these new enterprises. Um, you know, Mercado Central had had neighborhood development center and project for pride and living. Uh, PIP CLT had CLCLT and has other organizational institutional partners that are helping to bring strength to that. And so I think those are the, the one of the best ways to help shepherd and nurture some of the uh, groups that are initiating this work around the country. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and pause there because uh, we've got a lot more. I want to get to the questions and, and help to respond to those things uh, as well. So thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Mark, for sharing those insights um, that come from um, providing both the capital and uh, the technical support um, and more uh, to different kinds of projects. Um, we have a bunch of questions in the Q&A, so I'm going to do my best to sort of organize them and, and go through them. But um, I think there's a, a couple of questions. Maybe we can start with you, Dominique, just um, wanting to delve a little bit more into the PIP CLT model and kind of understanding um, what's the difference between a commercial land trust and a CLT? Is PIP CLT a nonprofit? How do you get this affordability investment um, to support small business owners in buying the structure? Like, what does that look like? And where's the capital coming from? Were things that um, popped up? If you can speak to some of those. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, PIP CLT is a nonprofit. Um, and I believe all CLTs are nonprofits. I haven't ran into one that wasn't. Um, so yeah, so we are a nonprofit and kind of the difference between a community land trust versus a commercial land trust. Um, so with uh, a community land trust in general uh, operates mostly, they're primarily um, operating in residential um, housing, providing affordable housing to um, low income folks uh, in uh, typically like low income um, areas. And so with us, we are focusing on commercial real estate and we provide affordability in that. And so I think that's uh, the biggest difference between us when it comes to our structure. Um, as far as the model, like I said, the models are similar. However, our model hasn't been done elsewhere. And so we're trying to prove the model. And so there are aspects of it that we kind of have to let things play out over time. So I know a question that I get a lot is about, oh, what's the resale structure look like? 
And um, that's one that is going to be that big question mark. With the community land trust, their resale structure is that they retain majority, um, a large portion of the equity has to be retained and sustained within that, um, that, that house um, in order so that it can be affordable basically for the next um, homeowner. If you pull all the equity out, that raises the property value, which makes it extremely more expensive. Um, and so it's a way for them to not have to keep pouring in more affordability investments um, for that same house. Um, and so they do that through keeping most of the equity there. However, they do share equity. And so I believe um, the homeowner will get about 20% out. For us, commercial can appraise differently over time than residential. And so that's something that we have to see how our commercial properties, you know, appraise when it's time to resell. And our biggest thing is we want to make sure that, you know, the business, the equity that they put in to it, that they're getting that out. That's that's the biggest thing. We want to make sure that whatever equity they put in, they're getting it out. And then whatever we are able to provide above and beyond that, um, that we can share it with them in a model that makes sense. And so right now we're still trying to determine what that will be. And we'll probably have to wait until we actually have a resale situation to test it out. Uh, what was another question? Uh, just around that um, subsidy that PIPSLT is putting in to help lower the costs for small businesses, um, sort of where that comes from. Um, and then I think there was also some questions just around uh, selecting entrepreneurs who qualify for the uh, for purchase um, and just challenges in general with um, finding folks and if people have um, questions about the limited equity model and what that means for them. All right, so let's see. Um, the first question was around, I believe, uh, kind of our, well, I don't know, I, this is what stood out was our selection criteria or no, our funding. Okay, so our funding in order to be able to, now again, I don't, we have two, different options within our model. So one is the straight ownership where the business is bankable, is able to get a loan and can purchase the building um, from us. The second one is the lease to own. And so when we're looking at the buy it, the purchase, we have to come in with free money basically. That's that affordability investment. So that money is raised through philanthropy dollars, um, public free grants dollars, um, all of that money we can't like take out as a loan or because we're basically, we're giving it, you know, we're putting it in as equity, as cash equity into the deal. With the lease to own model, however, um, you could think of it as a straight, you know, kind of rental lease agreement. Um, it's just that option to, to buy. And so with that one, we still um, can't take out like high interest rates loans. So we typically will go through um, other, uh, lending organizations such as um, MCCD, they've funded us and they have low interest rate loans. And so typically it's like two to 3% is what we could probably handle. Because again, even with the leasing, we try to keep the rents affordable. Um, and so we still, you know, we can't tack on so much interest there. So that's how we're funding these projects. We're also, to Mark's point, um, you know, community land trust, they've been around for a long time. Um, there is a lot of um, public dollars, uh, governmental dollars that they have access to, um, especially when it comes to affordable housing. There's just a lot of money in the budget for that. And CLTs have access to that. We don't have anything like that um, established with um, our city uh, budget or state budget. And so I'm also working on doing some advocacy work and um, trying to propose that there is funding um, set aside for uh, commercial land trust models. Uh, as far as the criteria, um, so our minimum criteria is we, our, our ideal candidate is someone who has been in business for at least three years and can show financial um, stability within those three years. Uh, we want to, again, set our businesses up to be successful and not to fail. And so we do have to do our due diligence to make sure that they can actually afford the building, um, even with our affordability investment. And so we do go through that. Um, Mark is our treasurer on our board and also um, sat on our pre-development committee. And so we did a lot of work with the pre-development committee and the finance committee to vet um, these businesses and then also making sure that they're, um, they're financially stable and secure. 
Uh, and then we're also, you know, yes, we do prioritize BIPOC businesses. I believe I saw a question about that and it's not illegal to do that. Um, and there's a lot of organizations that do. I mean, this is a disadvantaged group. Um, it's in statute actually. So BIPOC, if you go look it up, it's in statute and it's a, it's a class that you can call out and say that you're providing services for. Um, and we, um, I'm, I'm trying to think if there's anything, Mark, let me know if I'm missing any other criteria. I mean, it's, we don't try to make it like super, you know, extensive. I mean, one other thing is that it's the type of business. We want a business that is going to um, create vitality to the community um, and not extract um, negatively from the community. So uh, when we're looking at businesses, we're looking at businesses that do that. We also do get community input. Um, neighborhood organization input around what they want to see, what type of businesses. So they're part of our vetting process as well um, to make sure that we're putting a business that is going to, you know, help to, you know, uplift the community and that the community wants it there. Any questions that I missed? No, thanks, Dominique, and thanks for uh, tackling the many questions that I rolled together and threw at you. Um, uh, Eduardo, there's a question for you. Um, just uh, about, you know, that it took 18 years to transfer ownership to the cooperative. Um, so if you could speak to some of the challenges and lessons learned along the way, especially around um, keeping folks engaged with which Mark kind of touched on as um, a challenge. Um, and also as part of that, if you had to shift um, or change your strategy or or sort of any of the original plans that you had. Well, uh, you know, Mark spoke about this a little bit in terms of the democracy that exists in a cooperative. The, the, the concept of cooperative is it, it, this is a democratic run entity organization that decisions are made by the membership and that are, that are truly represented in the leadership of the organization. However, uh, there's a, a road that people have to walk to learn those kind of things. Um, as I was mentioning about Mercado particularly, you know, this was created uh, with newly, and sometimes with a very short time, people who have immigrated to the United States, language barriers, uh, understanding of the system, how things work here. And so that took a, a, a time to uh, provide the, the critical information, uh, education, understanding of how a cooperative is work here. In fact, there is a statute here in Minnesota that speaks about you know, uh, governing uh, uh, cooperatives. And so there's a lot of uh, uh, information that people don't or didn't know about this uh, particular uh, structure, as well as uh, the individual interest and self you know, interest that people have in establishing their business and being part of this cooperative. One important thing that I think that is uh, uh, worth mentioning is, I don't think that the, back then people had the, the ambition of, you know, becoming uh, wealthy or, or, or getting, uh, you know, a lot of money about of this model, but more about the opportunity to establish and become independent earners of their own uh, assets and wealth so that they can prosper and pass on that to their family. So, so that was one piece that took quite a bit of time. Uh, the second piece about this is how it was governed. Uh, it, as you probably know, uh, uh, cooperatives have to have as an entity uh, uh, board of directors and personalities, uh, ideologies, and all those kind of uh, uh, factors that play in a democracy are exemplified in an organization like this. Not everybody's on the same page, nobody, nobody's in, in, uh, can go or want to go along with the ideas and ideologies of, of, of the goals of the cooperative. So it takes a, a lot of time and a lot of effort to work with the membership, to try to keep him informed. Transparency, Mark mentioned, is critical. And even with that kind of a practices, sometimes thing go, things go off the rail. And, and, and it becomes really difficult because you are uh, managing uh, 35 plus individuals to align to one single vision or one single goal or one single uh, 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 way of moving forward. And so it takes time. 
it takes time to bring everybody on board, everybody understanding what is the, what is the end goal, who benefits, uh, what is the impact of that decision making, and also uh, making sure that you are putting in front of everybody the long-term uh, sustainability of the business, of the model, because many times we, just as a humans, we tend to, uh, to think about short-term or at the most medium-term goals, when in fact, a property like Mercado Central has to plan for a 10, 20-year uh, asset management uh, strategies to keep the property you know, running. Otherwise, it would be a, a, a very hard financial uh, hardship to try to maintain and keep the property running when nobody's paying rent, when nobody's paying, you know, utilities, when uh, um, services have not been uh, uh, maintained, and certainly when the infrastructure is not kept up to date in terms of, of, of uh, uh, structurally sound building. So uh, it takes time. It takes a lot of time, and that's what it happened here at Mercado Central. It took a lot of time to get through that uh, those uh, that information, even though we can speak about this in a very short time, but it takes a long time to people to come along. And those are some of the challenges that, that we, we face, uh, along with the fact that, uh, uh, you know, culture plays a huge role, in my opinion, in creating this type of uh, entities. And, and what I'm saying is, you know, the ones who should be running this organization and advising and working with us should be people who do understand, who do relate, who do have experience working with those communities, with those cultures, with those, with the language, with the, with the uh, uh, type of uh, that relate to the people who are part of the uh, of the uh, structure in the organization. Otherwise, it is very difficult to 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 run and and be able to achieve the goals that uh, you envision from the beginning. In this case, it took almost 20 years, but I'm happy that I was managing Mercado when the transfer took place from the uh, partnership into the uh, cooperative as a whole. So now they own 100% of the property. Uh, they run, they manage their own. The board of directors is running uh, the organization with a little bit of a part-time uh, consultant. So it, it has improved greatly from the early on, 10 years ago, it was a mess, <laughs> but now it is flourishing. And, you know, if not from the pandemic uh, and the civil unrest that took place here in Minneapolis, um, uh, the market is coming back and, and it's a vibrant, a vibrant economic uh, uh, place where uh, not, not just the Latino, but the broader community uh, comes and enjoys and, and, and shops and create that, that vitality that is needed in neighborhoods like South Minneapolis, so, yeah. Thanks, Eduardo. Um, I also saw a few questions, I think, for you, Mark, about Shared Capital Cooperative and um, supporting, um, you know, community land trusts who are maybe interested in um, partnering with limited equity cooperatives and just um, kind of what that looks like. If you want to speak to it briefly. Yeah, just a couple of things on that. Um, we, you know, we're we're involved with a couple of projects in development right now, where there is a, a proposed limited equity housing cooperative on in the property and a commercial land trust uh, owning the land underneath. I think that can actually be a very productive partnership. Um, you, you have on on the one hand, you have uh, the the potential to reduce the the total costs or debt that the cooperative has to take on by taking the price of the land out of the picture, of course. Uh, but I think another valuable piece is that the, the land trust can, through its land lease, can enforce or maintain the limited equity provisions of the cooperative as, as well uh, to, wish to uh, ensure that those stay in place per, in perpetuity. Um, so I think there's a really complementary uh, structure that can be built with those two models coming together. Uh, there aren't actually a whole lot of examples, but there are a few successful examples around the country. Great. Um, and then I think a few questions uh, just to end on that's really, really critical um, around the role of sort of local and county government um, that has supported both with uh, property acquisition um, and with some funding. Um, if you can share a little bit more about how that worked, like did 
uh, do CLTs have to compete for this funding through a competitive RFP process? Um, if not, like how is the how is local government channeling resources to these projects? And then I think even more broadly, like what did it take to get to a place where um, local government, uh, whether it's the land bank or other agencies, are um, willing to be really proactive actually in supporting this work? Um, which I think is uh, really important um, insights for other places that are uh, maybe just starting to think about this and, and interested in learning how they can um, do more. Maybe I can start. Um, we've seen a lot of appetite growing, expanding for this these models in our market here. Um, the city of St. Paul has dedicated resources for CLTs and their in their city budget. Um, in the Minneapolis, we have. Uh, staff members inside the uh, development arm that are trying to figure out how to segue uh, land trusts, long-term affordability, um, cooperatives, you know, how, how to fit those models into their funding sources. So it's really, they're really trying to figure that out. And now at our state agency, they're also trying to figure that out. So they're trying to figure out how to use their existing resources, but expand it to these other types of structures. Um, and so it's it's beneficial in that the value of these as long term affordable options, you know, the the, the longer extended public uh, value of doing that, uh, I think is really resonating for our public partners. And we're really seeing an exponential kind of appetite for doing this more so. But it is helpful to have people inside the government entities trying to push for and advocate for that and to, to um, internally kind of build those those pathways uh, for those resources. So I don't know if anybody else has some thoughts. Yeah, so I was definitely gonna say that, that there has definitely been an appetite. I saw it, I mean, when I first came into this um, work, this was right before um, the pandemic hit, right before the civil unrest. And I did not realize that that impact was coming and how much it would really catapult our work forward um, and just how much interest nationally um, we started to see around community ownership, especially around commercial real estate um, in BIPOC um, communities. Uh, when it comes to like our work with the city of Minneapolis, and then we're also, like I said, we're working with the city of St. Louis Park. Um, and so with the city of St. Louis Park, what we're doing there is we're working on a, um, they purchased an 8,000 square foot building. Um, they're seeing gentrification happening and they're wanting to attract more BIPOC businesses and sustain BIPOC businesses in St. Louis Park. Um, and so they approached us and they wanted to implement the, the commercial land trust model. And so they purchased this building and what we're going to be doing is redeveloping it into condo space. And so we will be selling off the individual condo space and folks will be placed into an association and all that. Um, and this is obviously even a newer model for us. And so we have to work with some other experts in that area to implement it. But um, I, I believe there was a question around just kind of how do a, uh, a large body of businesses own a, a space in a commercial land trust model. And that's one way along with the cooperative model. But with the city of Minneapolis, we did not have to compete um, there what we had to do was we had to um, sign an agreement, which was called a um, development agreement. And they gave us basically exclusive development rights. And by that, we would then be able to, if we followed certain guidelines, be able to purchase the, the building from them without having to go through an RFP process. And so that the building never you know, went through an RFP process. And then the same thing with St. Louis Park, um, we're going to be get, probably signing a development, exclusive development rights with them as well. So that's the way we didn't have to go through the RFP process. Uh, Eduardo and Mark, do you want to add any final thoughts about building local support for these models before we wrap? Well, I would just say that uh, I'm glad that we're talking about this, uh, not just locally, but nationally. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the fact that uh, racial equity and, and, and economic justice has rise to the top of the agenda, so to speak, nationally, uh, it's a good thing. Uh, uh, looking at these different models that traditionally have not been a way to invest, to bring capital, to bring resources to disinvested communities and, and marginalized groups, 
I think that it's a, it's a, it's a positive that we are looking uh, a trend in, in hopefully that can continue and grow and become normal to fund this kind of uh, uh, initiatives and this type of, of uh, structures that we are uh, creating and, and sort of the experiment in, so, in some cases uh, to demonstrate that this models work uh, to bring economic activity, investment, and uh, prosperous uh, activities to uh, disinvested communities and BIPOC communities. Yeah, I don't. I don't know that I have a lot to add to that, other than, um, you know, I think we're fortunate in the Twin Cities that we have some local government entities that are already sort of thinking, as Gretchen was saying, there's already some thought going into different kinds of shared ownership. So the door has been opened a little bit, and we just have to sort of find ways to productively walk through that and and build that. Unfortunately, I think in a lot of places there is no box for this kind of work to fit into, and so I think in a lot of places there needs to be some really early uh ground laying sort of to sort of set the stage for this and to start to introduce this and explore with your city county local planning departments whatnot to help them figure out which boxes it can fit in and which programs already might align well with this so you don't necessarily have to start from scratch um, but it can be a long conversation and it can there can be a lot of no's before you get to yes and so I think as we continue to build successful examples, it will be easier. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's a lot of it is going to really depend on where your what your starting point is locally. Thanks so much um, again to all of you for sharing your work um, and your expertise. Um, we'll be sharing again the resource page with the recording and the slides and uh, both of the reports um, that we discussed today, um, which include the the partnership and property um, case study, um, as well as the you know everything else that folks talked about the videos, the links, everything. Because um, I know there's a lot more questions um, about uh, about this work that we couldn't quite get to. Um, so thanks again to everyone for joining, um, and we'll be in touch. And hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thank you for having us. Thank you.